Hello again. Welcome. To the Generally Spooky Podcast. Episode 8. Episode 8 of Season 2. Mm-hmm. How exciting. I know. Only a couple episodes left. I'm quite sad that it it's coming to a close for I now. Know. We are coming back with a third season. We are. To we be clear. Really. It's not the end. We're not just doing like a classic British comedy series where you just get two series. I know, you only get 12 episodes total and, yep. then, and then that's it. 12 episodes of Faulty Towers. It's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> How have you been? Have you recovered from our Halloween episode? I have. I've gotten over the madness and the weirdness. We had a good Halloween, so I'm ready. ready I, think, for- I think I'm past it now. I think I've gotten over my block. Ready for some fresh spook? I am. I am. I'm ready for a new episode and just to get the ball rolling again. Yeah. I think it, it kind of stuttered and I found it a really difficult episode to put together last time. But I feel I feel good now. Good. It's done. Settled. Locked in. Before we get into the episode, we do have a couple of bits of almost housekeeping just notices. The first, thank you if you've donated to the podcast. Holy shit. Yeah, big time. Big <laughs> shout out to the, the people who have donated to us. Thank you so much. We can't believe it. We don't really talk about it very often, but we have a donate button on the website. Mm-hmm. And we don't talk about it because we're embarrassed. (laughs) (laughs) So we sort of assumed no one would donate, so we mentioned it in a couple of episodes at the start of season two. And some of you amazing, super awesome, lovely people have. So thank you so much. You don't know how much it means. When we get the notification that it's happened, we're actually stunned. Yeah. That we don't know what to do. and We just get awkward at each other for a couple of minutes (laughs) and then we just kind of move past it. Um, I've sent a couple of posts on social media but we have all kinds of things in the pipeline that we'd really love to to upgrade and to do uh so far donations have helped pay for the hosting for the generally spooky website and you've helped us pay for the software that we need to to process the podcast and get it out to you Mm -hmm. it's just phenomenal and we're really hoping we can move into things like new microphones new equipment and merch do you know how much I want to sell merch, Kieran? Do you know? I know. I have so many ideas. <laughs> there are. We want necromut stuff. I want a ham sandwich pin. Mm-hmm. All kinds of stuff. Yeah. And with your donations, we're gonna try and make it happen. Yeah, we we can we can do it. It they really it really helps. Yeah. That's basically what I wanted to say. So thank you so much. And if you want to donate, it's at generallyspooky.com forward slash donate, I think. I think so. And there, it's a PayPal, PayPal button. Yeah, it's through PayPal. And if you just go to generallyspooky.com, it's in the top menu. Yeah. You can donate via PayPal. And it's such a huge help if you're enjoying the podcast. It is. Thank you so, so much. Because, you know, you don't have to do it. No. Nope. This is free. <laughs> Pardon me. Also, uh, I put out a plea before Halloween. It's just kind of ongoing and open If you have a ghost story or some kind of personal spooky encounter, please email it into us because we would love to put together some episodes where we share your stories rather than me just going on at length. (laughs) (laughs) It would be really fun. And we have a few that people have sent into us already, but we want to make them into episodes. So you can email us at generallyspooky at gmail.com email them in. It doesn't matter how short they are, how long they are. We want to hear them and we want to share them with everyone who listens. Yes, we do. So, polite request. Yep. Share your spook. Please do. We can gather around the metaphorical campfire together. (laughs) (laughs) Share a ghost tale. Yeah. Sounds good. I think that's all. I think that's all. I made a note that we had to talk about. Sounds good. Do you have anything you, you want to tell the people? Nope, just... On the coattails of what you were saying? Nothing about your week, generally? No. No. I don't think so. We can just... Kieran doesn't do much. He just sits at the (laughs) desk and waits for me to finish a script so that we can record the podcast. Yep, I'm just like waiting all through the week. Like, you are for it to come out, I'm sitting here waiting for it to be finished so we can record it. Like, he doesn't get out of his chair. His legs have atrophied. (laughs) (laughs) We can just roll the music now. Thank you very much. (laughs)
now that we've finished savaging me, what is this week's episode about? I have no idea again. Well, we're keeping it slightly more casual this week. I needed a break to just recover. Um, especially as the past few episodes have been quite... I don't want to say intense, because it wasn't unpleasant, but there was a lot of historical detail, and I wanted to just change the pace a little bit. So we're going for something a little bit more fun. This week, we're talking about Kelpies. Oh, not Selkies. No. (laughs) No, this is another folklore episode, and I've tried to do a fun thing, because in episode 8 of season 1, we talked about the Selkies. This is episode 8 of season 2, and we're talking about Kelpies. And so a tradition is born. Yeah. Have you heard stories about Kelpies before? Um, I know of them, I think, but I did this last time, not the wrong way around, (laughs) that they're the the horses, like the ghost horses that get you to ride on top of them, and then they ride into the sea and drown you. Yeah, pretty pretty much. Pretty much. I think. Um, And that's the episode. (laughs) We'll see you next week. I'm taking a proper week off. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. And there's two big Kelpie statues in Falkirk. Yes, yes, part of the canal system, yeah. which we'll talk about at the end of the episode. But they do exist, and they're very impressive. I remember learning what Kelpies were in primary school. Mm. It was like it might have been a Halloween thing that we did, where you're learning about Scottish myths and and legends. And they're one of the scarier Scottish myths, I think. One of the scarier creatures that you you hear about as a Wayne. Well, they're not just chilling like so many. No, legends are no. creatures of legend. They're the actively out to cause harm. Yeah, which you know is always scary. Yeah, they're especially not... when you're like, seven. Yeah, absolutely. They're not like the Selkies who are just minding their own business and then get wrecked by humans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is the Kelpies kind of take revenge on the Selkies' behalf. Because they just wreak havoc on humans. For not really any particular reason. Just cause. I w- I'm not saying we don't deserve it. Nah. I'm just saying there's not a particular reason. Mm. I'll give the same disclaimer that I kind of gave at the start of the Selkies episode. Obviously Kelpies are mythological creatures. And the stories of Kelpies vary super widely from place to place in Scotland. So if I don't tell the version of the Kelpie story you know... Just email me and tell me your version and we can talk about it on the podcast. I'll email but you my version at the end. Please do. You know, it's your homework. There's an exam. Well, I've... You I've, remember, right? I, I remember there's an exam. I've just not been studying. Fine. I'm quite good with exams. Oh, boy. Fine. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Well, back to what I was saying. I can't fit every version of every story into this episode. I've just kind of picked and chosen certain ones to tell you about Kelpies generally. Sounds good. But I want to hear your specifics, mm. if you have them, because these stories vary from like lock to lock and river to river. There's so many across the country, so there's no way I can talk about them all. Mm. Like, ever. It just couldn't happen. So, Kelpies are mythical creatures, but generally evil creatures. And like you said, they usually take the form of a horse. Hmm. Uh, There's lots of variations of the colour from all the different stories. In some of them, they're gold. In others, they're really shiny, but completely jet black. Um, Dark grey, light grey, completely white, chestnut brown. You know, Mm. there's really no limit. Gold is the the coolest, you know. I would say so. Or maybe like jet black. Hmm. That's pretty that's pretty metal. That is, isn't it? But one of the strange things that sets Kelpies apart from horses, in some of the stories at least, is that their hooves are reversed. Oh. So their hooves are on backwards. That's interesting. Isn't that creepy? That is creepy. So they might just look like a normal horse, but then you see the hooves are on back to front, and you're like, oh, I see you. Oh. I wonder if people, like see hoof prints going to or from water, but they only see it in one direction. Mm. So it's so it only looks like a horse has gone into the water when it, really it's come out. Yeah. Spooky. Spooky. One version of the Kelpie story that I read described a Kelpie as having a mane made of snakes. Oh. <laughs> 
That would be noticeable. How's that for a frightening image? That is horrifying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. Medusa's stallion. Very cool. <laughs> and in the legends, if a Kelpie mated with a normal horse, mm-hmm. then the baby horse that they had together could never drown. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And they were different from other foals and horses that people might have because they had shorter ears. Interesting. That was a defining feature. And depending on where you live in Scotland, these hybrids were either crazy bad luck and you had to kill them immediately to save the rest of the herd and your family and your friends and everything. Mm -hmm. Or they were amazingly good luck and you had to protect them at all costs. Oh. I read both. (laughs) (laughs) So I guess it's just up to your better judgment if both stories exist. I mean, that they can never drown is a lot cooler than just being infertile like yeah M- mules? mules is that a donkey and a horse i think so as a mule i don't know i can't remember i think so you got a rubber mule can't drown <laughs> <laughs> well these ones can't drown because they're cool not because they're made of rubber no yep. not because they have a snorkel on no could you even do that to a horse hmm i feel his mouth is the wrong shape <laughs> It's awfully round, (laughs) pointy. (laughs) In some of the Kelpie legends, they're able to take the form of a human. Mm -hmm. And usually, more often than not, that human is incredibly beautiful, like we talked about in the Selkies episode. They're amazingly attractive, and you can't help but fall in love with them. Much like myself, yep. Well, naturally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are the inspiration for this story. (laughs) This is fan fiction, really. (laughs) But even though they're really, really beautiful, there's usually some kind of giveaway that something's not quite right. So if you came across them at the side of a river, they might be completely soaking wet, Mm. which isn't typical. Mm -hmm. Or they might have like really matted hair or lots of seaweed and water weeds in their hair. That's another Mm -hmm. clue that they're not human. What about, are their feet on backwards? No. You'd notice that. But some of the stories say that if a Kelpie turns into a human, they keep their hooves. Oh. So they don't have hands. Hmm. That's not a hugely common detail. I didn't see that in a lot of places. Yeah. I mean, that would be a dead giveaway. (laughs) Unless you had mittens. Oh, that's true. Completely naked and soaking wet, aside from these bright red mittens. No. (laughs) On your hands and feet. (laughs) Do you think uh, if they did have, like, hooves for hands then they could do the monty python thing with the two coconuts and they just bat their hands together to sound like a horse was coming i don't think they could hold hold two halves of a coconut with their hooves not holding the coconut <laughs> <laughs> i don't think they have the capacity to hold on to two halves of a coconut anyway you were almost right with your sort of description of Kelpies at the start. Mm -hmm. But the the thing with Kelpies is that generally they're prowling around rivers and streams. Mm. But this also varies wildly because a lot of the stories talk about Kelpies who live in lochs. Mm -hmm. But traditionally a Kelpie haunts a river. Interesting. Something about the running water. Yeah. Now, I think a lot of the confusion comes from the fact that there are other mythological creatures similar to kelpies Mm -hmm. from scottish tradition and stories so i think there's a lot of overlap and confusion between the two but i'll talk about them a bit later i think that's where a lot of the confusion comes from so i'm going to say now that a couple of stories i'm going to tell you talk about kelpies who live in lochs Mm -hmm. i don't want that to be confusing when i've just said that you find (laughs) them in rivers now if you remember the selkies we talked about are generally very kind and helpful and loving and they just kind of do their own thing yep kelpies are not like that Mm. not at all if you meet a kelpie while you're having a peaceful walk by the river you need to leave (laughs) pronto (laughs) because if it lures you in close enough it's going to kill you Mm. like an alligator arguably worse than an alligator or worse similar to an alligator yeah probably faster There's lots of different ways that they go about this in all the stories, Mm. and none of them are pleasant. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, can you get pleasantly dragged into a river? No, 
I'm no. about to prove that that is not the case. Kelpies are really a great way to learn the lesson that just because something or someone looks good and looks attractive, it doesn't mean you can trust them. <laughs> They're like the perfect way to learn learn that little nugget. <laughs> yeah. In some of the stories, uh, like you said, the Kelpie will lure their victim onto their back mm-hmm. when they're in horse form. And this person just thinks they've found the most beautiful horse they've ever seen. So they climb up onto its back back because it seems friendly. But then in these stories, the Kelpie's hide turns into something like super glue. Oh, nice. And they can't get off the horse again. They're stuck. Ooh. They're stuck on the Kelpie's back. And that's when the Kelpie will either walk or bolt into the river with the victim trapped on their back. And then once it's in the water... It'll eat whoever it's captured. Ooft. Ooft. Yeah, Kelpies eat meat. This is not a vegan episode. <laughs> this is not a vegan friendly story. It could be a pro vegan story, you know, that's why you're nice this is why you should be nice to horses. Otherwise they'll eat you, you know. Be nice to animals or or they'll eat you. I was gonna say, because I've never eaten a horse before. That you know of. There's all that scandal a while oh. back. Oh. <laughs> Kelpie uprising? Is it coming? Twenty twenty two? I think it'd be worse if it walked slowly into the river with mm-hmm. you stuck on its back. Oh, I think it'd be way worse. Yeah. So much worse. Yeah. They do have other methods of murder, which is fun, um, because it'd be a lot harder for them to do that when they were in their human form. Yep. Uh, naturally, if the Kelpie in the story is female, then she is stunningly beautiful, and she'll use her ethereal beauty to lure in her unwitting male victims. Naturally. Easily done. Yes. Yes, yes. Are the male versions hung like horses? I don't really want to comment on anything else to do with like penis or sex. I had enough last episode. I just I just want to have a nice time talking about horse murder. Okay. <laughs> That's all I want. <laughs> Yes, I'm going to talk about horse murder and then not have a bath for at least a month. It's just <laughs> or a very shallow one at most. Keeping an ear out for a yeah. like clippity clop. <laughs> I'm going to do that next time you go for a bath. I'm going to make like the noise outside the door. <laughs> like I was saying, uh, lots of ways of of murdering people. Mm-hmm. Uh, once a kelpie has you in the water, if they've lured you in, they eat you. And then they leave what they don't eat, either floating in the water or just on the riverbank. Nice. So the the lady Kelpie I was telling you about mm-hmm. lures you in with her beauty. And then she tears you to pieces and eats you and just leaves what she doesn't want. Brutal. Do you think you'd be lured in by Kelpie? Not a trick question. Because I know that they're really gorgeous. Genuinely curious. Um, I don't think so. Because I've never ridden a horse. So if I, if I came across a horse, my first instinct wouldn't be to ride it. What if you came across a beautiful naked woman? Would the instinct be to ride her? No. <laughs> <laughs> Danger. Danger. <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> See, because from my perspective, I am wildly distrusting of anyone that I don't know. Mm. Even some people I do know. So, the chances of me getting lured in by a Kelpie, I feel, are slim because I don't really trust anyone. Yeah, that's fair. Let alone naked strangers. Yeah, whereas I am, I'm a very helpful person. Mm, that's true. Because we came, we were walking in Glasgow one night and there was a woman who managed to get stuck in the door of like a public toilet. Oh yeah, forgot all about that. Yeah, and she was like shouting for help. Because it was like a, you put in the money and then the door opened and it auto shut. Yeah. And it auto shut with her hand on the inside. I'd forgotten all about that. That was so long ago. Yeah. And I went to help her and you were weary. I was weary because I couldn't see if anyone was on the other side of the door. Yeah. Yeah, it could have been a trap. Because it was night time in uh, the last nice part of Glasgow. Yeah, but it was nothing against her personally. No. I just, it's like I said, I'm gener- generally distrusting of people Mm -hmm. so and she was definitely just in that bathroom doing drugs yeah yeah but to be fair i think she was genuinely in pain it's just whether there was someone on the other side who didn't mind that she was in pain Mm -hmm. that was what bothered me yeah it had yeah just clothes on her wrist it looked Mm -hmm. really so yeah yeah so maybe i would get stuck by kelby 
maybe you would, but not for sexy reasons. No. For helpful reasons. Mm -hmm. Then maybe they wouldn't kill you. Maybe. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. If the Kelpie in the story that turns into a human is a uh, male, the it, it goes one of two ways. Either this Kelpie is ridiculously attractive, and usually Kelpies like this are similar to the Selkies in that they go about wooing young, naive women and then either kill them or take them away to be their wives at the bottom of the lock. Very nice, very nice. The second is that the Kelpie man isn't attractive at all. He's very hairy, really shaggy and unkempt. He's got seaweed in his hair, like I said. In one version of this scary-looking human Kelpie man Mm -hmm. story, uh, the Kelpie's hiding on the banks of the river, waiting for someone to, to wander past. And then when they do, they jump out at them and drag them into the water. Or in another one, they grab them off their horse and crush them to death in their hands. Ooh, that's intense. Which was a version I'd never read before, and it's nope. pretty brutal. Mm. Being like manually crushed. Yeah. Be even worse if they had hooves. <laughs> <laughs> Trampled to death. By but like just... the crusher from Star Wars. <laughs> you know where they're in the trash thing? Yeah. <laughs> Travel to death by a man with hoof hands, just punching you. What way to go? I know. In some of the legends of Kelpies, they have the power to raise and summon the river towards them in a big wave, Mm. a big flood, in order to rush people who are beside the river off their feet so they can eat them. Kind of like in Lord of the Rings. Very Lord of the Rings, yeah. Like (laughs) that. Uh, Some of them have that power so they can control the water around them. That's good power. And the sound of a Kelpie's tail when they're a horse is supposed to be like the sound of thunder. Ooh. Which, murderous tendencies aside, is very cool. That is very cool, to be fair. Like a thunder clap. Mm. A water horse that has a tail like thunder. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Uh, other legends go that if you hear wailing or howling when you're beside a river, if it sounds particularly unearthly or otherworldly then that's a kelpie Mm. and it's a warning that a storm is rolling in so you should leave that's cool which there's quite a lot of creatures that are like that that Mm. you hear you hear a certain wail or crying and it's it's a sign of a storm or some kind of omen that's cool yeah i like that that's something that crops up in folklore again and again which is interesting or dangers of the sea the superstitions around it. Well, if this is in a river, it's not really the sea. Well, that's true. It could just be because, like, a storm could be devastating. Yeah. I heard two horses having an argument <laughs> while I was walking the dog a little while ago because they were just they were in their separate paddocks and they were both up at the same fence looking at each other and they were just arguing. They were just like shouting at each other, <laughs> and it is a sound I have never heard before because it was. Like, I've not been around horses very often, but these horses were making some banana sounds. It was during the day, and I was like, I think it was a man. If it was night time, and I heard that and couldn't see what it was, I'd be terrified. Because it was just, just these horses were shouting at each other. It's probably where a lot of this comes from. Yeah. Really. Hearing things like that in the night and not knowing what it is. Kind of like the, it wasn't the similar sound, but like a stag's roar. We've talked about that a lot. Yeah. I had an experience. I don't know if I've talked about it on the podcast before. Uh, I don't know. I think so. I I had an experience as a child when me, my sister and my stepdad were camping. We used to go wild camping fairly often. And we were camping on this little island in the middle of a loch. And even if you just shouted particularly loudly, it would echo across the water and back at you. And we were asleep one night. It was pitch black. Me and my sister in the tent. And we just hear this honest to God, like demonic (sighs) roaring and it was echoing all over the water and all over around us. And we on, we thought our time was up. We thought that was... <laughs> this was the end days. The monsters had come to get us. And we found out afterwards that that's the noise that stags make mm. in rutting season. It's just... It does not sound like a deer. Yeah. I'm telling you. I'll, I'll try and find a clip of it somewhere. It does not sound like a deer. I've not heard it in person, but you've like shown me like clips on YouTube. Especially in the middle of the night, mm. echoing around a big loch. Like, yeah. that that was scary. It's just a bit much. 
It was even worse for India because she's younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> she was terrified. And then when I knew what it was, I made things a lot worse by telling her that it was like ghoulies and, and witches mm-hmm. and all that good stuff. All the good stuff. All the good stuff. I have to. You have to. <laughs> Kelpies also have the power to hold as many riders as they want. Hmm. In lots of the stories, they're able to extend the length of their back. That would be an odd sight. So that they can capture as many trusting victims as they can get all at once. That's all they can ride in this stretch horse. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like a limo, but murderier. Murderier. That's bizarre. Which leads me into a very common version of the Kelpie legend. That's told in lots of different places in Mm -hmm. lots of different ways. And it goes that ten children were playing at the edge of a river when they came across one of the most beautiful horses they'd ever seen. It was really quiet and it seemed really friendly, so all the children go over to pet it. All of them except for one. One of the children doesn't trust this horse suddenly appearing at the river's edge when they hadn't seen it before. So this child hangs back. They stay near the back of the group, not wanting to get too involved. The other nine are stroking this horse, and before long, it seems like the horse is inviting them onto his back. How lucky for them. Mm -hmm. It kneels before them, it lowers its back to where they can reach to climb on, and all nine of those children climb on the horse's back, so they can all fit. But that one child stays on the ground, but they start feeling left out before long because everyone else is having a great time. This is lots of fun. It's great. So the child left on the ground reaches out and starts stroking the horse's nose, but doesn't climb up onto its back. That's when the children on the horse's back realize that they can't climb down. They're stuck. And they pull and they pull and they try and they cry out, but nothing works. They're stuck on the horse's back. And the child on the ground sees that one of their fingers has become stuck on the horse's nose. And that's when the horse's eyes become darker. This isn't a horse at all. This is a Kelpie. All of the children are frantic at this point because the Kelpie begins heading into the water with them stuck on his back. And the child on the ground still has their finger stuck on the Kelpie's nose and they know they need to do something now or they're going to die. You know, the water's getting deeper. Now they're absolutely desperate, so the child reaches into their pocket for the small knife that they had with them. The water's up over their knees now and the Kelpie's only dragging them in deeper and deeper. So the child takes a deep breath and brings the knife down on their own hand, freeing them from the Kelpie's grasp but cutting off their finger. Before the child can do anything to save their friends, the Kelpie disappears under the water with all nine of the other children on his back and they were never seen again. So that's one that gets told fairly often, Mm. the ten children and the one child who cuts off their own finger. It's kind of a Kelpie classic. And a classic, generally, it's a big scary monster that steals steals away children to eat them. Another good story. Did you, think? did you enjoy it? I did enjoy that. The first recorded use of the word Kelpie was in the 1700s mm. in an ode written by a man called William Collins. And he spells it a bit differently from the way that you and I would, um, which is fairly common. Mm-hmm. But that's the first time the name is given to this creature in writing. Mm-hmm. But remember that a lot of Scottish and certainly Gaelic stories were always passed down orally, mm-hmm. rather than being written down. So the stories are likely a lot older, but that's the first written recording of Kelpie. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's generally believed that the name Kelpie comes from Gaelic. Uh, the word, the Gaelic words for heifer or colt sound a lot like Kelpie. Mm. Um, I'm not going to... I'm not going to butcher it here. I did that enough in the last episode. I said uh, Boleskin House wrong the entire episode. I'm not doing that again. Who knew? But that's where the name comes from. That's interesting. I always wondered if it was because there's kelp. It's a type of seaweed. Yeah, that would make sense. I wondered if Kelpie. it was that. If it was this big seaweed horse that just looked kelpy, you know. <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure the Gaelic word is like kilpuch. Hmm. Kilpuch. Something to that effect. I'm probably saying that wrong too. Who knows? Um, 
And that seems to be where the name comes from. What's really interesting, though, is that there are some people who think that stories of the Kelpies have been told as far back as the Picts. Very cool. So all the way back, over Mm -hmm. a thousand years back. Uh, Now, are you familiar with what Pictish stones look like, Kieran? Vaguely. The carved ones? Yep. Yeah. They're big and tall, rectangular, and... On a lot of the Pictish stones, there's carvings of animals. On some of them, when they were converting to Christianity, one side shows like animals and daily life, and the one on the other side has a cross Mm. with all the Celtic knotwork in it. But on some of these stones, there's this recurring picture, which is called the Pictish Beast. And it kind of is sort of difficult to explain. It kind of has the head and the torso of what could be a horse, Although some people think this is like a dragon. It's got quite a long nose. Mm-hmm. But the back end looks more like a seal or a fish. Interesting. It has a long tail rather than back legs. Uh-huh. So some people think that these carvings of the Pictish Beast, which happen in lots of different stones, mm-hmm. are evidence of stories being told of Kelpies mm. all the way back then. Which is kind of nice. It's like a, a common thread between all the people who've lived here. Yeah, that's interesting. I like that. Yeah. Obviously, like, there's no way to prove it. Like, we don't know. Mm. But that would be very interesting. Well, that's interesting because, like, the traditional dragon is the amalgamation of basically, like, all the dangerous creatures. Yeah. It's like a winged snake tiger that breathes fire. So, like, it's funny that a Scottish one, like, an ancient Scottish dragon would be part fish as well because the sea was so much of a danger. Yeah. And that's cool. I don't know. I'll need to show you... What the actual carving looks like. Yeah, just when you said it was dragon-like, I'm like, oh, maybe that like that was a Pictish dragon. Not the word, but yeah, what the yeah. dragon represented. Because it's got kind of like a long, thin nose. Yeah. Kind of like a, a traditional dragon. Not an anteater. <laughs> More dangerous than an anteater. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was really interesting. That is really interesting. That That's what that could be, or the stories could have stemmed from there. Mm-hmm. Now, there's only a couple of things that can defeat or kill a Kelpie. Mm. They're very, very powerful in all of the legends. They're very difficult to survive Mm -hmm. an encounter with. The first thing that can deal with a Kelpie is a silver bullet. I was just wondering if silver bullet. Oh, yeah? Yeah. But I thought, no, it won't be a silver bullet because it's too old a legend. So that's interesting. Well, if it was being written about in the 1700s. Uh, but yeah, just like werewolves, hmm. and there's probably lots of other monsters that silver or a silver bullet can kill, but you can use a silver bullet to kill a kelpie. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. The other way to save yourself from a kelpie is either grabbing hold of or stealing the kelpie's bridle. Hmm. I don't know how familiar you are with horse gear, Kieran. Is that the thing that goes around his head and like in his mouth? Yes, the bridle goes over the horse's face, oh. from what I've been able to tell. That's the bridle. And if you can hold on to a Kelpie's bridle, you have power over the Kelpie. Interesting. You can control it. If you take it home, do you throw a bridle party? Kelpies are widely known to be as strong as <laughs> to be as strong as ten horses. So if you can control a Kelpie and you can get it to help you, it would be a really good thing because they can do the work of ten horses. That would be pretty useful. They would just do it quite begrudgingly. (laughs) Um, I also read in one place that if you hold on to a Kelpie's bridle or you are in possession of the bridle, you have control over any Kelpie, Mm. not just that Kelpie. Oh, very cool. Which would be... A power unto itself. Yeah, you might queen of the sea yeah. or the rivers. Queen of the Kelpies. <laughs> yeah, that'd be very cool. And the bridle itself in all the legends is very powerful. So being able to steal and keep a Kelpie's bridle will bring its own magic and its own consequences. And I found a couple of different stories about the Kelpie's bridle. So I'm going to tell you these. We're going to talk about James McGregor first. And his encounter with a Kelpie in Loch Ness. Ooh, a local Kelpie mm-hmm. for Which local is people. Which d- is turning into like the most enchanted, spooky, I know, eh? mystical place that we've ever <laughs> talked about. Everything seems to happen there. And this is why I wanted to say earlier that although traditionally Kelpies are in rivers, a lot of the stories happen with Kelpies in lochs, like this one. The one I had uh, like a kid's fairy tale book which had Kelpies in it. 
I'm pretty sure it was in a lock, the mm-hmm. story it told. It's kind of jumbled, it's a bit mixed up. Mixed mm-hmm. up. Not hugely important, really. Yeah. This, is, this is happening in Loch Ness. Yep. Now, James McGregor lived near the banks of Loch Ness with his family. And for years, they'd heard stories of people, their neighbours, walking along the shores of the loch and disappearing completely. Sometimes their bloody remains would float to the surface of the water. But more often than not, nothing was ever seen of them again. Mm-hmm. They just vanished. Now, James had heard stories of the Kelpie living in the loch his whole life, and so far he'd done a pretty good job of keeping his family safe. But despite his best intentions and all of his knowledge, there was always a part of him that was desperate to see the Kelpie for himself. Mm, Danger. If there was a monster in the loch, he wanted to see it with his own (laughs) eyes. But not the Loch Ness Monster? No. (laughs) Just the monster in the loch? Yes. (laughs) But this is like part of this is like one of the threads of the Loch Ness monster legend that mm. a lot of people put it down to being a water horse at Kelpie. Um, I think we talked about that. Yeah, season one, episode ten. This is where this kind of ties in. Mm-hmm. Eventually, James's curiosity just became too much to bear. He decided to take a walk towards the loch, not too close, mm-hmm. but close enough to try and spot a shape under the waves. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that when it comes to Loch Ness. <laughs> yep. He walked under the trees along a path that was covered in leaves and twigs, and soon the water came up into view, lapping up over the pebbles that make up the shore of the loch. But James wasn't greeted with his usual view of the loch, the one that he knew so well. On the shore, he saw the most beautiful horse he had ever seen. And it was wearing the most beautiful bridle he'd ever seen. It was dark grey all over, the colour of campfire smoke, and had shining brown eyes. But even from this far away, he could see water dripping from the horse's mane and tail. Now, James wasn't fooled. This was a Kelpie, not a stallion, and he had to be on his guard. He knew that he should turn back and go home. He'd finally laid eyes on the Kelpie, that had to be enough but he found that he couldn't leave. He was fixed on the bridle that the Kelpie wore. And wouldn't it be better if he could rid the community of the Kelpie, the monster that killed so many of his neighbours? Oh, no. So James starts walking towards the pebbly shore, but he kept his eyes away from the Kelpie. He wouldn't meet its gaze. When he chanced a peek, he saw that the Kelpie was pretending to ignore him too. He got as close to the beast as he dared... His heart was racing and his palms were sweaty. And just as the Kelpie lifted its head to finally look at James properly, James pulled his claymore from his belt and swung it in a big wide arc. Oofed! The Kelpie shrieked and reared back in its hind legs, shocked at the surprise attack. The sword sliced straight through the shining leather bridle that the Kelpie wore and it fell to the ground. Oh, shit. And James snatched it up and then faced the Kelpie holding his sword aloft. But the Kelpie seemed frightened, not ready to fight. I believed you to be an honourable man, yet you've struck me when I mean you no harm. I've done you no wrong, the Kelpie moaned in a low, rumbling voice. Now James felt guilty, (laughs) because the Kelpie was right, James had struck first. He began to lower his sword. I should repay you with twice the cruelty you've dealt me for this treachery but I don't wish bloodshed. Return my bridle and you shall return with your life. And James looked again at the bridle in his hand and it seemed to be humming with magic and it shone brightly. Why should I? he asked. You're lying. You've killed many of my people. You're a monster. The Kelby's eyes seemed to plead with James. I do what I must to survive. Surely you can understand that. You must return my bridle. And James felt conflicted. What the Kelpie said seemed genuine and it made sense, but he had a bad feeling in his gut. Could he trust the Kelpie? He noticed how carefully the Kelpie watched the bridle in his hand. Its attention was completely fixed on it. The bridle was far more important than James had even realised. He came up with a plan. You can't convince me that you aren't a killer. I know what you've done. But I suppose I've behaved unfairly. I'll return your bridle to you if you tell me its secret. What makes it so special? Now, the Kelpie was hesitant at this, 
but it couldn't take its eyes off the bridle in James's hand. So it began to speak. Without my bridle, I'm trapped as a mere horse. It's my power, my life. If it isn't returned to me by the time the sun rises tomorrow, then I'll perish. I will be no more. Look through the holes in the leather at the lock. It will prove what I've said. It will prove how much I need my bridle's return. Now, James was worried about taking his eyes off the Kelpie even for a second, but was overcome with curiosity about what the Kelpie had told him. Was the bridle really that powerful? He lifted it up to his face and he peered through one of the holes at the water beside them and nearly jumped back in shock. Through the bridle, James could see all kinds of beings that were normally invisible to him. The good folk going about their business and paying him no mind. The world seemed brighter, more full and more colourful than it had ever looked before. It took him a great deal of willpower to pull his gaze away from the bridle again. It was just as powerful as the Kelpie had claimed it was, which also meant it was true that the Kelpie would die by morning if James didn't give it back. He could see an opportunity. He turned to the Kelpie, holding up his bridle. I appreciate your honesty. It's more than I expected, but now that I've seen what this bridle can do, I can't give it up. I think I'm going to keep it. I'm sorry. Cheeky bin. Mm-hmm. James turned his back on the Kelpie and began to walk away, trying to hide his shaking hands. The Kelpie roared in outrage behind him and began to follow him along the shore of the loch. No, you can't. We struck a deal. You can't go back on your word. You have no honour. James ignored the Kelpie. He kept walking and he stuffed the bridle under his coat. The Kelpie followed close behind. He could feel the breath on the back of his neck. Your joke has run its course. Your luck is at an end. Return the bridle to me and you will not experience the pain I wish upon you. James said nothing, but he flashed his sword at the Kelpie in warning and the Kelpie backed away from him. James could hear it muttering and cursing, but it continued to follow him, knowing that as a mortal horse now, it could not beat James. Mm -hmm. James's house came into view between the trees and the Kelpie became desperate. It galloped ahead of him and stood tall in front of the door to his home, blocking James's way. The Kelpie's nostrils flared and he growled, McGregor will never pass this threshold as long as he holds my bridle. He will never find comfort in his home again while I am without my power. James clenched, but didn't show the Kelpie how afraid he was. At the sound of the Kelpie, James's wife appeared at one of the house's windows, and her eyes widened when she saw the towering beast on her doorstep. He continued to ignore the Kelpie, and instead walked round to the back of his house. He tapped on one of the back windows, and his wife rushed over and swung it open. What's going on? What have you done? James pulled the bridle out from under his coat and he handed it to her. Hold on to this, he said. Do not open the door. James pulled the window close behind him and walked back to the front of the house, where the Kelpie was becoming more and more frantic, pacing at his front door. My patience is at an end, McGregor. Hand over the bridle. James just shrugged at the Kelpie. I apologise, but I, I don't have it anymore. It belongs to my wife. I can't give it to you. The Kelpie cried out in anger, scraping at the ground with its hooves. It turned to the door and backed away, getting ready to break it down. The Kelpie charged at the door, but just when it should have crashed into it, the Kelpie came to an abrupt stop. It tried to get to the door again, but it couldn't get close. It turned to James, and he pointed to the wall above the front door. The Kelpie craned its head up and saw what had been there all along. A cross made of rowan branches. It screamed in anguish, knowing that this meant it would never be able to enter James' home. It ran back to the law, cursing James McGregor in every way it knew how, but with the knowledge that it could do nothing to change its fate. Now James kept the bridle for the rest of his life, and he took advantage of the bridle's power. Legends tell of the bridle's healing powers by placing it in water, and the story goes that the bridle was passed down through James's family through the McGregor clan. And after James's actions, no one went missing after walking along the loch ever again. Oh... That was a good story. Did you like that one? I thoroughly enjoyed that. <laughs> I thought you might. Ooh. Can you imagine going to your window and just seeing like a horse blocking the door of your husband? Me, if you will. As, as if I had a husband. <laughs> <laughs> if I had a husband, how would I react? 
<laughs> well, Kieran, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, kind of been a good feeling. Yeah. Especially oh. when the horse starts speaking. He's like, what the hell? What was that, sorry? <laughs> <laughs> and the horse, they're the Kelby and Elding, they're like, hey, that's not fair. You struck first. I'm like, well, why would it have been fair if you struck first? Then you would have struck first. You know? Grasping. Grasping at straws. It's the hand Solo argument. Of who shot first? Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. You, yeah, you know. You know. I know. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's the Kelpie of Loch Ness. Mm. But in other ones I've seen that it's Loch Slocht, not Loch Ness. Mm. But, you know, everyone has their own version. Who knows? Who knows? And yeah, the legend is that the McGregors have had the Kelpie's bridle handed down through the centuries. Very cool. That'd be super fun to, like, to buy a bridle and tell your kids that oh, that yeah. was the bridle. I might just do that anyway. <laughs> yeah. okay. I'm not McGregor, but that would be really sweet. <laughs> now, the other story about a Kelpie's bridle that's pretty well known is similar, mm-hmm. um, as these stories tend to be, but it follows a man called Graham of Morphy, who was the Laird of Morphy. So I, even though it's fairly similar, I wanted to tell you this one too. Where's Morphy? Uh, Forfer. Where's Forfer? Northeast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Graham lived near Forfer, like I said, and he quite enjoyed being a laird. He was one of those characters that we've talked about a lot on the podcast Mm. because he had power and he had money and he liked it. Just over there lairding it up. Yeah, and if anything, he just wanted more power and more money (laughs) because that's always what happens. But of course. Now, Graham decided that he deserved a bigger castle than he already had. I can see why he would have come to that decision. Because he was a very important man, Mm. and he needed a castle that better fit his status. But he didn't really want to have to wait that long for it. And he didn't really want to put in all the work of building and paying for it. Mm. That whole trouble, isn't it? I know, it's a nightmare. So he came up with a plan. Graham had been hearing stories for years about a Kelpie that lived at the bottom of a loch close to Graham's castle. And the tale spoke of a magnificent chestnut horse with a beautiful silver saddle and silver bridle. But whenever anyone approached it to take it home, they were swept off as soon as they climbed on its back and were dragged to the bottom of the loch and they were never seen again. So Graham knew the risks. He also knew how strong Kelpies were supposed to be. But he knew if he could get his hands on the Kelpie's bridle, then the Kelpie would have to do his bidding. Mm. And that's how he would get his castle built. Now he went to his wife and he ordered her to go to the Rowan tree in the gardens of their castle and to get two small branches from it. And he told her that she had to tie these branches together to form a cross. And then he ordered her to hang it over their front door. Oh. oh. Mm-hmm. Now Graham knew that the Rowan tree was the witch's tree. Uh, usually planted for protection. And the cross, obviously, is a holy symbol. So there's no way an evil creature like a Kelpie could walk underneath an object with that kind of power. Now, before he left his home that night, he told his wife to lock the door behind him with all the locks and to put the bar down. No one could come in the front door. But he asked her to leave the kitchen window open on the ground floor, which was unusual, Mm. but she did as he asked. Now his wife tried one last time to stop Graham pursuing the Kelpie because she was afraid for his life. She knew how powerful Kelpies were, but she also felt that even if he was successful, no good can come from what he was planning to do. But Graham had no sympathy for his wife's feelings. (laughs) He pushed her away and he stalked out into the night, armed only with a small knife. Before long, he reached the loch. And he couldn't believe his luck when he saw the tall chestnut horse grazing by the side of the path. Mm -hmm. Graham snuck through the trees and just as the Kelpie turned to see what was approaching, he charged at the Kelpie and struck at its face with his knife. He managed to cut away the Kelpie's bridle and immediately stuffed it into his pocket, not giving the Kelpie a chance to snatch it back. Now, the Kelpie flew into a fury at the loss of its bridle, especially since Graham made no effort to hide his glee at his successful plan. Graham of Morphy, return my bridle or I will take possession of your home, the Kelpie boomed. 
Now, Graham just smiled smugly at the Kelpie, and it galloped away from the lock to Graham's castle. And Graham just strolled back home after it, unbothered. When he finally made it back to his castle, he saw the Kelpie pacing around the front door, unable to get in. Graham laughed cruelly at the Kelpie and went round the back of his castle, climbed through the kitchen window and closed it tightly behind him. He jogged up the stairs and leaned out of the hallway window, which looked out over the front of the castle, to the Kelpie below. I've defeated you, creature. You're my servant as long as I have your bridle and I have need of a castle. You will help me build it and then I will return it to you, freeing you of my service, Graham called out the window to the furious Kelpie below. The Kelpie, with no choice, agreed to Graham's terms. And Graham was an incredibly cruel master to the Kelpie. He worked it to the bone day after day, forcing it to carry huge loads of stone with no food or water. After seven long years, Graham's castle, the new one, was finally built, but the Kelpie had suffered greatly. Its chestnut coat no longer shone. It looked frail and thin, not intimidating and proud as it had done. It was exhausted and spent. From a high up window in his new grand castle, Graham leant out over the Kelpie as he had done many years before and threw the bridle down to it as if it were nothing. Here, take it and leave. Go back where you belong, ugly beast. You're not wanted here. The Kelpie stared darkly up at Graham, fed up of his cruelty and his mistreatment. It picked up its precious bridle and bolted away from the castle towards the loch. But before it disappeared under the water, the Kelpie cursed Graham. Sore back and sore bones, driving the Laird of Morphy stones. The Laird of Morphy will never thrive as long as the Kelpie is alive. Mm. Now, Graham was unbothered by the Kelpie's rage and resentment because he had a castle. <laughs> he was pretty well chuffed. Until his young son died within a year of the Kelpie's release. Before long, Graham himself became seriously unwell. Deathly ill. Graham never got to enjoy his grand majestic castle, as he died soon after his son, leaving his wife alone to mourn her son and husband. Now the legend says that she died of a broken heart, leaving the castle empty to fall into ruin. The Laird of Morphy's family died out completely, erasing his family name from history and satisfying the Kelpie's desperate desire for revenge. Mm -hmm. And apparently, Vane Castle is a real castle, a ruined castle near Forfar, that's also close to a river. And at this river, there's a large block of sandstone. And this block of sandstone has a hoof imprint in it. That's very cool. We definitely need to go and see that. (laughs) (laughs) Ooh, I like that. You like that one? I like that one. It reminds me a little bit of one of the Norse mythology stories, because there's the dwarf who builds the wall around Asgard, and he gets this big majestic horse to help him. Is it a giant? Oh, you're probably a giant, that makes sense, because it's a giant wall. Yeah, he gets a horse to help him build it. Very cool. So yeah, and that's that's quite a common story as well, sort of taming a Kelpie in order to get them to help you build something, mm. or to work for you, because makes they're sense. so powerful. Mm-hmm. Makes sense when your livelihood will depend on your horse in quite exactly. a big way. And there's... There's similarities between these two stories, but there's also differences. Like in with Graham's Kelpie, it didn't die the day after it lost its bridle. Yeah, and he he gets his comeuppance. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Yeah. You feel more sorry for the Kelpie in Graham's story. You do. I think there's also a sense of you not messing with what you don't understand. Mm. I yeah. don't think you should have gotten involved. No. Especially just for greed. Yeah. At least uh, the guy from the other story. James. James was doing it for protection. A little bit for just, like, curiosity. Well, he still benefited. Yeah. Seeing through the magic holes. <laughs> now, in other stories, like I said, I'm not going to tell them all in this episode. Because, mm-hmm. like, where are we? How long is it? I know where. See, it's already quite long. Um, but in other stories, the Kelpies steal away beautiful maidens to be their wives and sometimes they manage it but sometimes the kelpie's killed uh, by the maiden's family and Oof. they're able to rescue her at the last minute hope that doesn't happen to me 
there's one story where the Kelpie's trying to steal uh, the daughter of a farmer, but he catches him around a mill, mm. and he thinks he's a thief, so he kills him. Oof. But there's one Kelpie love story from Barra, I think, where the male Kelpie's caught uh, in his attempts to steal away a young woman, and he's made to work on her father's farm. But in the end, she returns the bridal that she stole to save herself. But he decides to stay as a mortal man because he's fallen in love with her and they get married. And he lives forever as a human man with her. Lovely. I think that's the only properly nice one I read. (laughs) (laughs) They don't happen very often with Kelpies. Is that actually the prequel to The Princess Bride? That's how Wesley becomes a farmhand. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) That's a good movie. That's a good movie. And a good book. book. That's why he's so strong. Maybe. Interesting. Mm. (laughs) Get to writing, Kieran, get to writing. (laughs) Some Kelpies sing to lure people to their deaths, kind of like a siren. Mm -hmm. You get enticed by their lovely singing voice and then they kill you. Some people are saved from the Kelpies because they just happen to have Bibles in their pockets. I feel that was a story created by a certain group in particular. (laughs) always carry your bible well i read there was one article that was saying that a lot of these stories and the stories about children getting Mm -hmm. eaten by kelpies was a way to stop them playing on sundays oh nice (laughs) (laughs) well because i think with the the children on the horse like to be aware of the dangers of being by the water and stuff oh yeah well i've got a bit we can talk about that a bit later like why these stories exist Uh i have a couple of theories but yeah, like it happens in every culture, you get stories like that. But yeah, the addition of the Bible in the pocket, that seems to be where that came from. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. That sounds about right. <laughs> One of the legends I read talks about, because usually Kelpies are just on their own. Mm-hmm. Like you don't get a group of Kelpies, it's one. But there's one story where the Kelpies and the fairies have worked together to build a bridge over the Dornick Firth. Oh, cool. Uh, Apparently because the fairies are sick of crossing the Firth in cockle shells. (laughs) So they decide to build a bridge, and it's a a big, beautiful, golden bridge. And it's amazing and stunning. And then humans ruin it because they come along and they bless the Kelpies for what they've done. And because they've blessed them, it destroys the bridge. Oh. Oh. Well, that was made by a certain other group who were mm-hmm. anti-Bible. <laughs> I thought that was funny. But yeah, the fairies crossing the Firth and cockle shells. That's an amazing image. Mm-hmm. It's very Terry Pratchett, I thought. Yeah, that's the that's the kind of thing the wee, the wee free men would do. Yeah, I just thought it was a lovely image. I think there's a Thumbelina movie where I think they sail in like a little walnut shell. Cute. That's what it made me think of. <laughs> <laughs> what I thought was really interesting was that there's a Kelpie story associated with Corrie of Reckon. Where's that again? Well, I don't know if you've heard of Corrie of Reckon, but the Corrie of Reckon whirlpool is the wor- world's third largest whirlpool. Oh. It's a real thing. It exists. It's uh-huh. there. And historically, there's been a Kelpie story associated with the whirlpool. That's very interesting. Isn't it? A way to sort of understand... Yeah. What's happening and why it's so dangerous. Now, do you not know about the Whirlpool? Well, I've heard of Cory of Reckon, but maybe it will. Oh yeah, there's a huge Whirlpool. Oh god, look that up. That sounds really cool. We can do that, we can do that. But yeah, there's, there's a Kelpie story. I like that. Yeah. And this is kind of what leads me into the reasons for these kind of legends mm-hmm. and the origins of these stories. Which I love talking about when we talk about folklore. I think mm. it's as interesting as the story itself. Yeah. Because it's humans trying to make sense of the world around them. And like we were saying, I fully believe that Kelpies are a way that people have come up with to rationalise the dangers of the water. Yeah, and just explain them to kids and things. Yeah. Not all the stories of children. Like, oh, well, if you're playing by the water and you don't have an adult with you... The Kelpies will get you. Yeah. So that, don't play in the water. That's why you don't disturb the water. Like, don't go in the water. Yeah. Because they wouldn't have known how to swim. 
No, they, likely, no. They definitely wouldn't have had, like, a life jacket. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, definitely not. And there's a lot of rivers and lochs and coastline mm-hmm. in Scotland. So it makes sense that so many Kelpie legends exist. Yeah. Because there's so much water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on top of that, I was saying earlier that the Kelpie legends get confused with like other bits and pieces of folklore. Uh-huh. Well, the Kelpie is different from another Scottish creature, which is... I can't... I need to look up how to pronounce it. Give me one second. Because I know how to say the second bit, but not the first bit. Oh, Kreplock. No. A murloc. Yachushka. That's why I had to check. So, the water horse and the kelpie are two different Scottish mythological creatures. And the water horse is the Uchushka. Uchushka. I just heard it. I just heard it as well. I have no idea. The water horse (laughs) is... The Gaelic translates into water horse. Mm. Ush, ushke, I think. Maybe. Don't know. And by all accounts, they're even more vicious and fearsome than Kelpies are. Oof. But they live in lochs and big bodies of water. Mm. So I think there's been confusion between the two creatures and all the legends and stories have kind of... Amalgamated. Yeah. Was it there's so, so many crossovers and so many overlaps. Uh-huh. Because you call the white horses, or like the white bits on top of waves, they're the white horses. Like if you're looking out onto... Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, the water. Oh, you mean like the water horse. Like a water horse, yeah. Play, I think. Well, that's a fun fact, but why? It's not relevant. I mean, it's like water horses in locks and stuff, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't see them as often in a river. No. So I think that's part of the reason for all of the Kelpie legends, mm. that they've kind of been blended together over time. There's also Scottish legends of water bulls, oh. which are kind of similar to Kelpies, but they're generally very kind and very friendly. Mm. A lot less murder in a water bull story. Which is funny, because I, th- I would have thought a bull would be less friendly than a horse, typically. I don't I guess. Both can be quite temperamental. Yeah. But yeah, traditionally, mythologically, the water bull is far nicer. That's, that's good to know. You don't mind meeting a water bull. Mm. You don't want to meet a kelpie. Unless it turns out to be a walrus. Yes. <laughs> or a hippo. In which case, stay away from both. <laughs> They're both bigger than you. Yeah. Just stay clear. Now, as far as the origins of these stories go, it's really difficult to tell because... There are stories of water spirits and evil water creatures literally from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Now, Orkney and Shetland have their own legends, their own water creatures. I think there's one called the Knuckle Lavi, which is huge and big and scary. Uh, There's the Wiwin, W-I-H-W-I-N, from Central America. The Bunyip from Aboriginal mythology in Australia. And the Neeker from Iceland. Oh. And they're all very similar to the Kelpie in lore mm-hmm. and legend. They exist everywhere. And I, I think it's for what we talked about, that water is dangerous mm-hmm. everywhere. And everyone wants to try and either warn others from the dangers mm-hmm. or... I've completely forgotten what I was saying. <laughs> yeah, just like just to be aware of and teach children about the dangers of being near the water to be careful. I always wonder how like widely believed these legends were or if they were kids' stories to the people at large at the time. I feel like a bit of both. Yeah. Because I think or I always kind of initially imagined that, oh yeah, like everyone believed this and everyone like believed there was Kelpies. But then well, not necessarily. Like they might have told the stories and they'd tell them to kids, but It doesn't mean they necessarily believe them. I guess there's a middle point somewhere where you tell the stories partly because you believe it, but partly because it's just important to your culture. Yeah, it's just... That these stories are part of who we are, so we tell these stories. Oh, yeah. And they have a lesson in them. Mm -hmm. They're like parables almost. Kind of, yeah. Just, they they have their own meaning. Yeah. Without being like directly like, oh my god, I think I just saw a guilty kind of thing. It's such an interesting part of 
Scotland's history, I think. Mm-hmm. I don't. I think you do a disservice to Scotland's history if you don't talk about the folklore. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Because, yeah, it's such a big part of, mm-hmm. of who we are as a, as a people. As the people. And it's really interesting to look at how these stories differ across the country, mm. when it's such a small country. Yeah. It's funny, and it's funny how everyone will want to claim it, even though it's terrible. Mm-hmm. Like, you would think you wouldn't want a Kelpie to be in your loch, but I bet everybody did want a Kelpie in their loch. Kind of, yeah, or just to be able to, to tell the story. Yeah. Well, they're a pretty well-known legend as far as Scotland's mythology goes. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm sure there's some parts of Scotland's mythology nobody really knows anymore, but I feel like most people know what Kelpies are. Not least because there's the Kelpies in Falkirk now, which we talked about at the beginning. They're huge metal sculptures of horses, and they're actually the biggest horse sculptures in the world. Very cool. Which I didn't know. And the artist talked about how he combined the the mythology of the Kelpie along with trying to recognise the importance of the work of horses in the canal system in Scotland. Oh, cool. Because you know, they made everything work and they mm-hmm. pulled boats. So it's kind of got dual meaning, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, that's interesting. And Robert Burns also wrote about Kelpies in one of his poems. Oh, what didn't he write about? <laughs> Addressed to the Devil. And a lot of people think this is because of what I was telling you about with the human hooves. Mm. That they were associated with the devil for this reason, because oh, yeah. classically that's what the devil looks like. That's funny, because in my head I went to Mr. Tumnus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, he wrote he wrote about Kelpie's one yeah. of his poems, which is always a good claim to fame. Yeah, <laughs> if Burns is written about you, have you been talked about by Robert the Burns? Robert the Burns. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the probably somewhat incomplete legend of the Kelpies. Lovely. Now, what I will say is, if you're interested in finding out more, then I'm going to try and make sure I share something I found, which is called The Kelpie Map of Scotland. Oh, cool. Which I found online. There's an author called Larry Dawn who's written fiction books about Kelpies. Mm -hmm. I think they're kids' books. And they've put together this map on Google Maps of Kelpie stories. So you can look at the map of Scotland and there's a little icon if there's a Kelpie story associated with this place. That's funny. And you can click on it and it'll tell you a bit about the legend. Yeah. So because I I haven't really been able to scratch the surface with this episode, there's so many, I'll try and have that link somewhere so you can just have a scan and see where has a legend of a Kelpie. That'd be cool. Are there are there a load of them? Yeah. There's loads. Imagine them being everywhere. Yeah. Literally, every, if there's a lock, there's a Kelpie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I'm very, like, easy to say this is an incomplete Kelpie episode, mm-hmm. because I can't do a complete, full one. An overview. I'm not writing a novel. I don't, yeah. I can't. Who had the time? But I picked a couple good ones. I like them. I thoroughly enjoyed them. Yeah, enjoyed just hearing some stories today. I know. It's very pleasant. Right? That's what I wanted. It's still a little bit spooky. Well, yeah, they're still being eaten. They're still being lightly eaten. Or crushed. Yeah. Drowned. Also find it funny, the, the horrible way of a horse having glue on its back. Oh. <laughs> it doesn't have glue on its back. I mean, it's if, just, if you're getting stuck there, it's the a bit coat like is just like, sticky. But not with glue. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what's sticky? Glue. <laughs> So yeah, just be wary around rivers and streams and locks. Yeah, be careful because water is dangerous and don't trust a horse near water. Shouldn't really interact with or annoy horses that don't belong to you, really. Yep, you even know. if they are having an argument. Yeah, just, you know, stay out of it. You don't <laughs> know what they've been through. You don't know their life. I was in the river in Ullapool when I was young, eh, playing having a good time, and a horse walked past and I was... Very confused until I saw the owner on the other side of the horse taking it for a walk. She wasn't riding it. <laughs> she, like, had it by its reins and was walking beside it. Very odd sight. They're going to be like, is that a horse? Oh, there's a person. That's fine. Well, I guess you don't see many wild horses yeah. here anymore. I saw some near a canal in France. That was pretty cool. Wild horses. I feel like we saw some in Iceland. They're quite common there. Oh yeah, rings a bell. I think we did. One of the times we went driving. I'm sure we saw some wild horses. I didn't see anything though. 
Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for listening if you've made it this far. I feel like this has been a rambly, casual episode this week. Keeping it cash. <laughs> keeping, it, keeping it cool. And if you'd like to casually donate to us at generallyspooky.com forward slash donate, that would be very much appreciated. Yes, if you feel like it, if we have made you laugh or have taught you something you didn't know, then consider it. It would be really kind of you. It yeah. would help us out a lot. But I'm always very hesitant to request donations for anything because it just feels wrong. <laughs> and I don't know why. <laughs> it just does. So we should get paid for this. Who? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and your ghost stories. We we want them. We want them. Yes. We're going to collect them. Local legends, even. Local myths. Mm-hmm. Things, stories you grew up with if you were of the Scottish persuasion. Even if you're not, we want to hear them. Send us your spook. Yes. And we will speak to you next week with more of our spooky programming. (laughs) Regular regular programming will resume. Speak to you next week. We'll speak to you next week. Bye.